I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Marco Layton, whom I've known for more years than either of us need to admit. Dr. Layton is a full professor and a co-director of continuing medical education in McGill University's Department of Psychiatry, a past president of the CCNP, a member of the Positive Valence Committee that created the NIH Research Domain Criteria, otherwise known as RDOC, and a founding member of the Scientific Advisory Council to the Canadian Center on Substance Abuse, Substance Use and Addictions, CCSA. As you'll hear today, Dr. Layton has a body of pet research that's always at the leading edge of the field, posing and answering fundamental questions about the neurochemistry of addiction and relapse vulnerability. His studies in healthy control subjects and youth complement and inform his work in the clinical populations, offering a window onto differences in neurotransmission that may predate or even predispose substance use disorders. Marco is a creative, data-driven thought leader in our field, recognized for taking on the big questions. For example, does addiction vulnerability reflect too much sensitivity to reward or too little? I think you may hear more about this today. Though today we think of Dr. Layton as synonymous with pet research, he did have a life before pet. Dr. Layton received his bachelor's degree from Memorial University of Newfoundland and his MA and PhD degrees in, at Concordia with Dr. Jane Stewart, who, along with Roy Wise, highlighted the importance of reward in animal models of addiction and reinstatement. Dr. Layton thus imprinted on the importance of reward early on, and he was intrigued by the interaction between neurotransmission systems and between appetitive and aversive motivational circuitry. Now, these interests may sound a little abstract, but they really leap to life when you hear the title of his 1996 paper. You'll remember this, Marco. Acute and repeated activation of male sexual behavior by tail pinch, opioid and dopaminergic mechanisms. <clears throat> I should quickly point out that the research subjects in these studies were non-human. As a postdoctoral fellow at McGill, he moved on from tail pinch in rats to neuroimaging in humans, and he hasn't looked back. During the past 20 years, Dr. Layton's pioneering translational research program in the neurobiology of substance abuse has led to more than 140 papers, book chapters, and reports, and more than 100 presentations at academic institutions and conferences around the world. We're very pleased to have Marco with us today for one of these. Please welcome Dr. Layton for presentation of the Robert T. Mallison Lecture, Neuroimaging Pathways to Addiction, Holy Grails and Other Tales. Marco. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anna Rose. And my goodness. <laughs> That's very flat, very thorough. I did more, more things than I remembered at times. But how wonderful. How you wonderful. Did, you did repress that thing, did you know? <laughs> Oh, no, no, that was a fun one. <laughs> I'm not sure whether you admit it, but some of those videos may have shown up at a few parties. But, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> there you go. oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Much too early in the day to be admitting things like that. Right. <laughs> All right. And slideshow. All right. Well, yes, thank you very much. Flattering and, and lovely walk through my, my history of my work. Uh, thank you, Anna Rose. And, and thank you all for inviting me to this really quite wonderful event and the in initiation of uh, this fantastic uh, initiative and research center. Uh, well, uh, you know, apparently I'm on your advisory board, but in truth, it's such a terrific group of people that mostly I'm just looking forward to seeing the results of the fantastic studies you've proposed already. Uh, this lecture today is named after uh, Bob Mallison. I did not have the good fortune to get to know him or, or certainly not to know him well, uh, but I did read many of his papers and chapters over the years and was consistently impressed by the incisive clarity of the writing and both my student and I are, are really very, very grateful for all that work. It's perhaps uh, auspicious and a uh, lovely coincidence that today, October 5th, is UNESCO's World Teachers Day. And so thank you again. Thank you again, Bob. I thank uh, many of the trainees in my own group who've made such important contributions to the studies that I'll be describing today. That includes Kevin Casey, Sylvia Cox, Ariane Fotros, Natalia Jaworska, Mikhail Melela, Isabel Boileau, Maisha Iqbal, Paul Gravel, Elaine Setiwan, 
and Kelly Smart. Paul and Kelly are uh, doing wonderful postdoctoral work with uh, some of you at Yale right now. Each of these people contributed uh, in wonderful ways to the PET studies that I'll be describing today. I'd also like to mention Mariah Einhetrot, Kevin Casey, Elizabeth Colley, Sean Barrett, and Dinod Vinogopalan, all of whom worked on the dopamine precursor depletion studies that I'll be describing. The studies also benefited from terrific faculty colleagues in Montreal, and that includes Bob Peel, Jean Seguin, Simon Young, and Chalky Benkofat. Uh, Chalky, as you might know, died earlier this year. Another great, great and terrible loss for our community. Someone gone much too young. Well, I don't have a formal conflict of interest slide, um, but I have none to report. And all of the work that I'll be presenting today was funded by the Canadian equivalent of NIH. So why study actions? Well, I doubt I really need to convince this crowd that this is a good idea, um, but I just thought I'd run through what I consider some of the main reasons why this is a, an important endeavor. The first is pretty obvious, and I'm sure you've all written this in one of your grants uh, or in your papers. But I also consider addictions interesting because I see them as a prototypical example of how pre-existing vulnerability traits intersect with environment-dependent neuroplasticity to yield varying clinical outcomes. And insinuated in that is also, I think, this growing idea that by studying addictions, we can also learn features that increase risk for other psychiatric disorders. The work that I'll be describing today focuses on the dopamine system. I've looked at other transmitter systems in relation to addiction-related behaviors, but dopamine's really been the focus of most of that work. During the first decade of this century, that included a series of pet raclopride studies that looked at the effect of acute drug administration on striatal dopamine release using the raclopride method. We certainly weren't the first to report evidence of even amphetamine-induced striatal dopamine release, but this study, conducted 20 years ago now, uh, early enough in the days of uh, the method to be able to measure dopamine release, that we were actually able to provide some uh, methodological innovations that improved the anatomical resolution and enabled us to say with greater confidence than had been seen before that these effects were occurring preferentially within the ventral limbic striatum. That aspect of primate striatum that corresponds in a functional sense to what we would call the nucleus accumbens, rodents. Subsequently, we went on to see very similar effects following intranasal self-administration of cocaine powder, as well as following the ingestion of an addictive substance from a quite different pharmacological class, ethanol. Together, these and related studies provided evidence that substances across pharmacological class potently engage the mesostriatal dopamine system very much as has been described in microdialysis studies in uh, laboratory animals. There are marked individual differences in the magnitude of these effects. In the first study, the greater the amphetamine-induced striatal dopamine release, the higher the participants scored on the personality trait of novelty seeking. This was a relatively modest sample size, uh, but we and others have subsequently gone on to replicate this essential uh, association in much larger samples, including some quite elegant work by David Zald's group while he was in Tennessee. In this study, he used phalopride rather than raclopride as a tracer, and that allowed him to look at dopamine D2-3 receptors outside of the striatum, including the midbrain cell body region. And this enabled a three-way association to be identified. The lower the midbrain dopamine receptors, putatively inhibitory autoreceptors, the lower these midbrain receptors, the greater the stimulated striatal dopamine release, and the higher participants scored on trait impulsivity. Subsequently, we reported a very similar three-way association in people with cocaine use disorders. Here, also using phalopride, we found the lower the midbrain D2 receptors, again, putative autoreceptors, the greater the cocaine Q-induced striatal dopamine release, and the greater the Q-induced craving response. The core finding in the striatum in association with craving was not such a surprise since Anna Rose and colleagues had reported this same effect a full decade earlier. 
Well, these associations were important to document and, uh, and replicate, but in and of themselves, the associations with the behavioral traits are just that, correlations. To get a better sense of the causal mechanisms involved, we've been using a method called the acute phenylalanine tyrosine depletion method. The method is based on known features of the metabolic pathway for synthesizing dopamine. Dopamine has to be made from something. Turns out the starting point is ingestion of the essential amino acid phenylalanine. Within the liver, phenylalanine is hydroxylated to, to tyrosine. Tyrosine is then taken up into the brain, the dopamine neurons, where it's a substrate for the rate limiting enzyme in dopamine synthesis, tyrosine hydroxylase. The second hydroxylation produces l dopamine which is then rapidly decarboxylated into dopamine. Because the rate-limiting enzyme in dopamine synthesis is normally incompletely saturated, the availability of these precursor amino acids can decrease uh, dopamine synthesis and dopamine release. The method is well validated in microdialysis and voltammetry studies in laboratory animals, as well as this pair of pet ractopride studies in humans. On my right, uh, uh, Phil Cohen's group reported that ingestion of one of these phenylalanine tyrosine deficient mixtures decreased extracellular dopamine levels in the striatum when participants were at rest, or at least as much as lying in a PET scanner is restful. A few months later, we reported an even larger effect when participants were given amphetamine. Together, these findings uh, confirmed that ingestion of these phenylalanine tyrosine deficient mixtures decreases dopamine release both at relative rest and in response to an addictive drug. With this method better validated, we've gone on to the behavioral studies with more confidence. The first question that we tested is an hypothesis still widely cited uh, uh, within the literature, uh, although the people have been critical of it. And this is the idea that dopamine is closely related the drug-induced euphoria. In this first study, our participants were non-dependent uh, recreational cocaine users. They came into the laboratory about once a week uh, on a number of occasions. Each morning, they ingested one of these amino acid mixtures, and then in the afternoon, ingested a series of cocaine doses. What you can see is there is a nice linear association with dose of cocaine and the self-reported euphoria. More importantly, none of the pleasurable effects of cocaine were altered by the dopamine manipulations. Nor have we found that these dopamine manipulations changed the pleasurable effects of amphetamine, nor the pleasurable effects of ingesting a large dose of, a, of your favorite alcohol beverage, or smoking a series of cigarettes in tobacco-dependent smokers. Together, these and additional studies provided fairly, well, a very consistent and perhaps the largest body of evidence indicating that in humans at least, dopamine is not closely related to the pleasurable effects of addictive drugs. That's not to say that all of the findings of these studies were negative. To the contrary, we've seen a very consistent series of results that are more consistent with the idea that dopamine is closely related to the incentive salience of a, a reward-related cues. In this first study, Participants took part in a go-no-go -no -go task. In essence, they sat in front of a, a, a pet monitor or a computer monitor. On the screen, a series of numbers came up. The participants then learned by trial or error that if they pressed for some numbers, they would win money. If they pressed the button for other numbers, they lost money. Most people learn this task fairly quickly and make very few errors. What you'll see in this graph is that when people were put into a low dopamine state, they lost the predisposition to preferentially respond to the reward pair of cues. Because this entails an increase in behavioral output, it's not secondary to a motor deficit. On the contrary, they're now responding erratically um, when they both when they should and when they should not. We've also seen evidence that putting people into a low dopamine state can decrease uh, self-administration behavior. In this first study, the participants were very mild social drinkers. On the morning of each test session, they ingested one of the amino acid mixtures. In the afternoon, they were then presented with a series of canisters. There was red wine, white wine, rum and coke, vodka and orange juice, rye and ginger. 
We then ask them to taste from these different canisters and rate them in various sensory characteristics, sweetness, dryness, how much they like, and so on. What we were really interested in, though, was how much would they choose to drink when all the alcohol was in front of them? What you can see is that under these conditions, very mild social drinkers choose to drink less alcohol when put into a low dopamine state. We actually had trouble reproducing this effect when we test heavier drug users, neither the frequent cocaine users, tobacco dependent cigarette smokers change their self-administration behavior with freely available uh, substances when we manipulated the dopamine function. We have seen these effects again, though, when we make them work for the drug as uh, measured with, by a human version of the progressive ratio breakpoint paradigm. Here, in a group of heavy, high-risk social drinkers, and participants were working for multiple shots of their favorite alcohol beverage. To get the total number of shots available, they literally had to press the button thousands of times. The task is tedious, but this is the point. We're asking them, how much is it worth it to you? Would you pay $5 for your next beer? How about $10? How about 20? What you can see is that under these conditions, even these high risk, heavy social drinkers choose or are less willing to exert effort to obtain successive units of their favorite beverage when put into a low dopamine state. We subsequently went on to see the same effect in cigarette smokers. And I particularly like this study, if you'll allow me to say so, because we tested participants across the range of addiction stages. There's a group that we might call chippers, early chippers. These individuals had only started uh, smoking in the past 12 months. We're smoking no more than four or five cigarettes a day, not necessarily even every day. Then a group of uh, uh, stable chippers. These individuals also were smoking no more than four or five cigarettes a day, but it stabilized at that level for at least three years. And then there is a group of more prototypical tobacco dependent smokers, individuals who are smoking at least a half pack of cigarettes a day, and we've done that for a number of years. They're on the uh, progressive ratio of breakpoints uh, test. They were working for mini cigarettes. We literally took a cigarette, cut it into 10 pieces, each piece equal to roughly one standard puff in a cigarette. And then they pressed the button up to 50,000 times if they wanted that full cigarette. The first thing you'll see is not surprisingly, the dependent smokers were willing to exert much more effort than the chippers for these mini cigarettes. More importantly, though, across all three groups, when we put them into a low dopamine state, they are less willing to exert effort to obtain the, the tobacco. What this finding suggests is that irrespective of other changes that might be occurring, as people transition from casual to addictive substance use behaviors, the role of dopamine and the motivation to seek out the drug remains the same. Together, these studies have implications for psychology, behavioral neurobiology, and addiction science. They suggest that first, that changes in pleasure are not required for changes in motivational states. That neurobiology is not the same. That drug-seeking behavior is promoted by increased dopamine transmission rather than decreases. And that pharmacotherapies for addictions will likely benefit from a dopamine component. But we now have a better understanding why this is not proven to be sufficient. The next question of interest in these studies is when, whether these dopamine phenomena might change following repeated drug administration. We've been particularly interested in the possibility that some of the effects might become progressively larger, a phenomenon commonly called sensitization. Sensitization is well described in the animal literature. Here's the nucleus accumbens response and animals receiving their first ever dose of amphetamine. There is a dopamine response and animals receiving their sixth dose of amphetamine. These effects can become context dependent. So here's the Cummins dopamine response and animals receiving their dose of cocaine. Here's the Cummins dopamine response and animals receiving their seventh dose of cocaine and receiving it in the same environment where they'd received the previous doses. And here's another group of animals also receiving their seventh dose of cocaine, but receiving it in a place where they'd never previously obtained drug. A complete absence of the expression of dopamine sensitization. 
These context-dependent effects can also occur behavioral effects of the drug. Here, for example, is a group of animals, the locomotor activity response when they receive their first dose of drug. Here is augmented sensitized response in animals receiving their fifth dose of the drug. And here's the response in another group of animals also receiving their fifth drug, but now receiving in a place that have been previously explicitly paired with the absence of drug. Not only a complete absence of the expression of sensitization, but even an active inhibition of the effect below baseline. This effect even stronger than the sensitization effect itself. We can also see evidence that the drug sensitization effects can cross sensitize to other phenomena such as, as Anna Rosa indicated earlier, I began doing studies in uh, laboratory animals. And this was actually the first publication while I was in graduate school. And what we found was that in animals that have been previously exposed to repeated electric foot shock, the locomotor activity response to an intranucleus accumbens injection of amphetamine was markedly larger as compared to uh, control animals. Whether sensitization occurs in humans has been much more controversial. This has reflected two main observations. First, Initial attempts to demonstrate drug-induced sensitization in humans were uh, successful. Second, once it became possible to measure dopamine release in the human brain, those individuals with the greatest lifetime increase in stimulant drug exposure showed, if anything, evidence of marked decreases in stimulant and uh, dopamine release. Since then, there's been much more consistent evidence that sensitization can indeed occur in humans. Two main differences seem to distinguish the positive from negative findings. The first difference is the dose of drug given. Whereas the first two negative studies only gave five or 10 milligrams of amphetamine, eight of the subsequent 10 next studies that gave at least 20 milligrams of amphetamine did indeed find evidence of behavioral sensitization in humans. The second feature that seems to distinguish the positive from the negative studies is the dependent measures collected. This shouldn't be surprising. What we obtain in our studies depends on what we measure. The most consistent effects to become sensitized are the stimulant drug-induced energizing effects. In parallel to this, we've also found evidence that we can see uh, amphetamine-induced sensitization in the human brain. To this end, we recruited a group of carefully screened healthy volunteers and expose them to it a repeated amphetamine regimen. Uh, the top panel shows the racopride response with the first dose of amphetamine, very similar to what we and others have reported before. Participants were then administered additional doses of amphetamine on an every other day uh, schedule. There is then a two week break, at which point they are then brought back to the lab and given a fourth dose of amphetamine. What you can see in this middle panel is that the racopride response to the fourth dose of amphetamine is much larger than that produced by the first dose, providing the first evidence in the human brain of stimulant drug-induced dopamine sensitization. In laboratory animals, these sensitization responses can be remarkably enduring, lasting for a year or longer. To test whether these effects were also enduring in our human participants, we brought them back to the lab a full year and gave them the fifth dose of amphetamine. What you can see in this bottom panel is that not only was the sensitization effect still there, but it was even large, quantitatively larger in the sense that the effect in ventral striatum was bigger and qualitatively larger and that the effect had now spread in measurable effects in dorsal lateral striatum, those aspects of the striatum that are thought to play a critical role in the development and expression of stimulus response habit-like behaviors. Since then, we've also seen evidence that drug stress dopamine cross-sensitization can occur in humans. Here, and we recruited a group of carefully screened healthy individuals. Half, all of the participants received multiple exposures to a laboratory stressor called the MIST. Half of the participants between these two MIST exposures, stress exposures, received the repeated amphetamine regimen and you can see on the left panel here that those individuals showed a markedly greater 
rachlopride response to the second stress exposure, um, providing evidence of drug stress, dopamine cross sensitization in human brain. The next question of interest is whether we can see the effects in substance users. These data come from the cocaine study that I showed you earlier. Again, there are marked individual differences in the magnitude of the dopamine response. In this case, the greater the cocaine-induced dopamine response in striding, the greater the lifetime history of stimulant drug use on the street, an association that is consistent with the development of sensitized dopamine release in, re uh, in relation to stimulant drug use on the street. Much to our surprise, though, when we essentially repeated this study, this time giving amphetamine as a drug challenge, we saw the complete opposite association. Here, the greater the lifetime history of stimulant drug use, the smaller the amphetamine-induced striatal dopamine response. I will not claim that I predicted these opposite associations a priori, but I quickly came to like them very much. The most parsimonious explanation that I've come up with is that it's related to the presence versus absence of drug-related cues. That's exactly what was going on in these studies. In the cocaine study, participants were presented with a mirror, a bag of cocaine powder, a razor blade, a straw. They then spent 10, 15 minutes preparing the powder into a couple of lines and ingesting it in their usual fashion. Which is to say, for this period, they were immersed in a drug cue rich microenvironment. In comparison, in the amphetamine study, there is a complete absence of drug related cues. The amphetamine tablets were encapsulated in a non descript gel cap. None of the usual drug related cues are present. It didn't appear anything at all like the usual experience with the drug. Uh, and together, these findings then raising the possibility that in humans, as in laboratory animals, sensitization is more likely to be expressed, might even be augmented when people are tested in the presence of the drug related cues, and it's less likely to be expressed, might even be inhibited in the absence of these cues. Based on these and related results, I proposed a relatively novel uh, model of the role that dopamine might be playing as people start to develop substance use problems. In essence, the proposal is that in drug users, in the presence of the drug-related cues, dopamine cell activity is elevated, and this sustains the drive to obtain rewards. In comparison, in the absence of drug-related cues, dopamine cell reactivity is low, might even be actively inhibited, and this diminishes the ability to sustain focused goal-directed behaviors. Together, these bi-directional effects might contribute to the progressive narrowing of interests commonly seen as people develop substance use problems. Well, in many ways, all of these studies were done just in preparation to ask what for me was the main question of interest. Is there evidence that these processes are disturbed in people at risk for substance use disorders? In the first of these studies, we had three groups of participants. At one extreme, we had a group of stimulant drug naive healthy controls. At the other extreme, we had a group of stimulant drug users, with dense multi generational family history of addiction problems. And then, intermediate group, um, they showed, whoops. Uh, they were matched to the high risk individuals on their personal drug use, but there is no family history of addiction problems. This design we proposed would help us disentangle the contributions of familial risk from the drug use itself. All participants were in their late teens and early 20s. By definition, the stimulant drug naive individuals had never used stimulant drugs, whereas the two drug using groups had and did not differ from others. I think interestingly, they also differed in personality traits, such that both groups of stimulant drug users had elevated novelty seeking scores as measured on the TPQ. And intriguingly, only the high risk individuals had elevated scores on the novelty seeking subscale impulsivity. Not an ideal measure of impulsivity, but still I think an intriguing observation in and of itself. Uh, in this study, the drug challenge was amphetamine, 
and as in our previous study, it is encapsulated in the gel caps, which is to say none of the relevant drug-related cues were present. Here's the racoprive response in the stimulant drug naive participants receiving their first ever dose of amphetamine, a robust racoprive response, again, primarily within the ventral striatum. Here's the response in the uh, family history negative drug users, a slightly muted racoprive response. This reflecting that negative correlation I showed you earlier, but not significantly different from the healthy volunteers. And here's the response in the family history positive high risk participants, almost complete absence of measurable dopamine release in these high risk individuals. This study providing the first evidence that stimulated striatal dopamine release is altered in people at risk for addiction problems. In the second study, we selected participants specifically for being at risk for alcohol use disorders. Here, the drug challenge is a large drink of alcohol, um, which is to say the cues were unambiguously present. It looked like alcohol, it smelled like alcohol, it tasted like alcohol, it was alcohol. Participants again were di uh, differed markedly on their risk for addiction. Here, using Mark Shuckett's Shaft scale, again, uh, all participants were in their late teens and early 20s. The two groups were well matched for this as well as their age of first intoxication. Surprisingly, the high-risk participants were now engaging in more drinking episodes per week, drinking a bit more, but were reasonably well matched um, on their lifetime exposure to alcohol. Um, they showed evidence on the mask and starting to develop more alcohol-related problems, as well as showing other features that you might expect to see in this sort of sample. Here's the raclopide response. Um, to the big drink of alcohol in our high risk participants. And here's a response in the low risk participants, the complete opposite of what we saw in the amphetamine study. Here, it's the high risk participants that are showing a measurable dopamine response, and nothing we can even detect in the low risk participants. Together, these two studies again suggesting that people at risk for addiction problems have altered dopamine responses. But the exact direction of effect seeming to depend upon the conditions. The last study that I'd like to tell you about um, was our first attempt to get outside of the uh, stratum, here again using F18 labeled thalapride. We had two main predictions. The first was that the high risk participants would have low midbrain cell body reach two receptors, putative autoreceptors thereby producing less inhibitory feedback, primarily to the mesostriatal dopamine cells. And secondly, that there would be increased terminal reach in D2 receptors, and together these two effects producing greater dopamine transmission. We had the great fortune in this study to be able to recruit our volunteers from a longitudinal birth cohort, very well described participants. Uh, in fact, it was their pregnant mothers who were first rec uh, recruited a few decades ago. Uh, 58 participants completed this study. Uh, when we did the PET scan, they were all in their late teens, well matched for sex, different in the impulsive, in, uh, irritable mood, personality traits, what we often call externalizing traits. And not surprisingly, the high risk individuals had greater lifetime histories of substance use and other substance related features already. They are also, by the way, more likely to meet criteria for various commonly comorbid psychiatric disorders, either currently or in the past, as well as differing on a number of different personality traits. This hypothesis was not actually supported. There were no group differences in midbrain D2 availability. However, there were quite compelling associations uh, with these. Uh, punishment reward personality related traits. The lower the midbrain D2 receptors, which is to say the lower the putative inhibitory autoreceptors, the less sensitive they were to punishment, the more sensitive they were to reward punishment ratios. Our second hypothesis reported and terminal region uh, D2 receptors were elevated uh, throughout much of the cortex as well as subcortical regions 
The effects appeared uh, visually to be larger in the cortex, but there were no group by region interactions, suggesting that this is a brain-wide effect uh, throughout dopamine terminal regions. The last question that we've asked of this data set is we've tried to integrate all of these ideas that we've been working with over the last 20 years and basically asked whether a three-factor model composed of these three main features that we've been interested in, the impulsive explaining personality traits combined with early life stress and individual differences in dopamine autoreceptors, whether this combination of features might predict with more power who goes on to develop an addiction and addiction-related disorders. Regression for this analysis, 52 participants had sufficient data for this full, uh, full uh, uh, question. Um, it was based on the diagnostic interview when they're in their late teens and the pet phallic pride scan taken at that time. Participants met criteria past or present um, for mild substance use disorders but also a wide range of common comorbid conditions, including mood and anxiety disorders, ADHD, binge eating, and so on. What we found in the analysis was that the three-factor model was not specific to addictions, but actually predicted risk for any of these different diagnostic categories. The statistical power, I think, is quite striking, 10 to the minus 5. It accounted for over 90% of the area under the curve, and the classification of accuracy was also 90%. We then followed up these participants two, three years later to see who else might have developed a psychiatric disorder, including these data, and we were still able to reproduce the three-factor model um, with a statistical robustness. So, together, what these findings suggest is that um, young adults at risk for substance use disorders exhibit a number of distinctive features. That includes altered drug and reward cue induced striatal dopamine release, increased terminal region D2 receptor availability, and individual differences in these midbrain D2 putative autoreceptors co vary with striatal dopamine release and sensitivity to punishment and reward. The combination of these low midbrain D2 receptors, high early life adversity, and impulsive personality traits predicts the early onset of a wide range of commonly comorbid conditions. Together, these studies support proposals that addictions and common psychiatric disorders reflect varying outcomes of overlapping, intersecting dimensions. Thank you. We must unmute so that we can have some fun. <laughs> That was delightful, Marco. Well, well thank you, Anna Rose. Do we do we have questions? If I'll, I will, of course, come up with uh, a couple. If other people we, jump in, I don't. We have limited time, so we're going to probably only be t able to take two questions. I'll allow others to have a first go. If you have a question, please unmute and just ask. All right, go ahead, Anna Rose. Okay, so um, Marco, one, and of course, there's a wonderful tour de force here and trying to integrate these findings that go back and forth and up and down and the literature is just, it's it's wonderful to do that. Uh, one, of the, one of the papers that was a kick for me a, a few years back was when you looked at healthy controls, asking the question essentially, okay, is someone shown what looks like, you know, a release, uh, increased release of dopamine in the context of the scanner. And I guess questions people might have is how quickly does conditioning set up this learned yeah. cue condition property? And you had a, a, a fun story that there were controls and when they brought them back to the scanner where of course, you know, they had had amphetamine. Can you tell us what happened in terms of their Raclopri competition? Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for asking that. Um, I Anticipated the question actually, uh, although we did not this honestly. Uh, there we go. <laughs> it wasn't a setup; it's just one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, can people see the? Did I bring the slides up again properly? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm guessing Anna Rose is referring to. 
Yeah. So the design was uh, very similar to some of the experiments I described before. In essence, uh, we, a group of stimulant drug naive, uh, carefully recruited healthy volunteers, um, exposed to the repeated amphetamine regimen. Uh, here in the top panel, this is the racopride response to the first dose of amphetamine. Um, let's just say it's very similar to what we and others have reported before. Uh, as Anna Rose already hinted, they were then given only two additional uh, doses, so a total of three doses of amphetamine, all given in the PET scanner during sham scans. There was then a two-week break, at which point they were brought back to the now drug-paired PET environment. What you're seeing in the bottom scanner is that this was sufficient to induce a conditioned striatal dopamine response. So the effects develop very rapidly, which is uh, similar to what is seen in laboratory animals. And I, I think I was, we were delighted to see this effect. Uh, one interesting other feature is that the effect, the conditioned effect in this study was specific to the ventral striatum. In comparison, what uh, Anna Rose, what you've reported, we're looking at Q-induced responses in people with cocaine use histories, and we've replicated this too, in people with, sorry, cocaine use addiction problems, the largest effects are in the dorsal striatum. Um, as you might imagine, people like Trevor Robbins and Barry Everett love this because, of course, it fits very much with their <laughs> idea that with more extended drug use, as people start to, yeah. as behaviors become more habitual, the condition effects shift to more dorsal regions of the striatum. And we've seen that also. Yeah, it's, it makes an interesting and fun story, but thank you for that slide. And no, we did not set this up in advance. <laughs> I had a question, actually. This is Sarah Jones. Hi, Marco. Oh, hi. Um, hi, Sarah. Hey. Hi, hi Anna Rose. Um, it seems as though the uh, dopamine response to cues and the dopamine response to the drug itself um, are, are, are almost... Are they equal or so? I would have thought that the Q response would be far less than the drug response. So you, I was surprised that you were able to find that the Q um, was responsible for the cocaine uh, sensitization. Um, is, the, is that true? The the magnitude of the Q and the and the drug induced dopamine are similar. I would try, I'm going to try to put those slides side by side and you see as you were hoping. Um, the conditioned effects are smaller than this uh, drug induced sensitization. Effects. <laughs> uh, let's see, where are we? I was hoping yeah. that. <laughs> so. All right. So, here again in this bottom panel, uh, this is the conditioned response, right? Um, there are measurable effects, but they're pretty, just barely, just barely being pulled out in the analysis. And I th think, oh, do darn, did the wrong. Um, where is the sense of sensation? Ah, here we go. The sensitization effect is much larger, covering much of the striatum. And of course, by the fifth dose, it's massively bigger. Mm -hmm. That said, science is or the way we think about what the brain is doing. And I know people have expressed this idea before that if the but I'll propose. What does the brain evolve to do? Respond to the environment. Oh, that's important, right? That's really what it's designed. It wasn't designed to respond to drugs. And sure, the drugs go in and do their thing. But that's not really what it was designed to do. So in some ways, I'm not entirely surprised that the effects are in the same ballpark, even if, as you would have guessed, the drug effects are larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very nice. May, may I jump in and ask a question? This is Dr. Abkaran from Northwestern University. I'm an external advisor, and I really do not know much about the, the topic, but I am uh, interested and, and want to learn. So is how much of this, of the brain imaging 
the traces that you are working with, uh, the, what is the spatial specificity in a way, you know, uh, reward versus punishment, D1 versus D2, shell versus core, I mean, those, how do these things, at least methodologically, where do we stand along those lines? Well, the traces in terms of distinguishing uh, receptor subtypes is really quite impressive. Uh, the, the traces of the ligands are quite specific for the different receptors. The anatomical resolution is a harder thing to answer. Um, is it good or is it bad? I guess it depends on what you want. Uh, <laughs> I'll say compared to what people, lab people do with laboratory animals, um, it's not great. Um, it, it, we're just really not at that, at that level. Um, the anatomical resolution is not great. The temporal resolution is not great, uh, but it's the best way to do it in human brain. And then we can ask some very interesting questions despite that. Define the exact then. Oh, go ahead. Go on. I don't mean to be a criticism. I just mean is what is the future? Or what, or, or we, are we going to get to a, something to more specific you know, location specificity, for example, and what it would take and Maybe the, the center will actually address the question. I don't know. I'm just sort of exploring oh, the yeah. concepts. Yeah. yeah. No, as a field, the, the, the anatomical resolution continues to improve decade by decade. Um, the first cameras were around, I mean, they were very crude, but they've been around since the 1950s. Um, and basically, people were just excited. We can see the brain. <laughs> oh, boy, it's a brain. And there's a brain tumor, a mass, I mean, a massive brain tumor. Yes, um, of course. Yeah, which, I mean, yes. The, the, the I resolution step, now is. Yeah, the resolution. Sorry, hi. This, this is Bob Mack. If I could, I could step yeah. in. I think that's a very good transition, actually, into some of the presentations that you'll hear as part of the course, because Dr. Carson at Yale is really going to give a, a beautiful, a really nice overview of the advances in, yeah. in, in instrumentation that can address some of those questions and. And some of the scanners that we have access to it here at Penn and at Yale. So those are important questions. I, I noticed we are getting a little bit behind schedule. I, I think this was such a fantastic and, and, and important, fantastic talk and an important topic. And we can go on for another hour. And unfortunately, uh, we are not able to do so. So, so what I'd like to do is ask everyone to unmute briefly and, and, and give Dr. Leighton a, uh, uh, great applause for our fantastic presentation. <laughs>